Hi everyone, I'm Wayne Hodes, the General Manager of the Trenton Thunder. And on behalf of the whole Trenton Thunder family, and of course my friend Boomer here, we'd like to wish you all a very happy holiday season. It's because of you, our loyal fans, that 1994 was so successful. And hopefully again, April 6th, we'll see you all out at the ballpark and have a great 1995. And at 7.11 p.m. daylight savings time here on the East Coast, the first pitch in Thunder history about to be thrown. It is a ball high and away as O'Neill takes it and takes a lead in the count 1-0 on Rod Henderson. A new era began in Trenton, New Jersey this past spring when the Trenton Thunder, then the AA affiliate of the Detroit Tigers, spread its wings over Mercer County and the Delaware Valley. The arrival of the Thunder, who came to the capital city from London, Ontario, marked the first time in more than four decades that professional baseball would call Trenton its home. And what a home it was. Mercer County Waterfront Park, with all of its beauty and character, became the most talked about stadium, not only in the Eastern League, but also along the East Coast. Fans came in droves to quench their inquisitive thirst. For many, it was the first time they experienced minor league baseball, but it certainly wasn't going to be their last. The thought of bringing the Trenton Thunder to New Jersey began, like so many other projects, as a dream. A dream which received some criticism. But once ground was broken for the future home of the team along the Delaware River in South Trenton, this criticism turned to anticipation. An anticipation which was nurtured in October and November and tickled even more when the name Thunder was unveiled. Later, excitement grew even more when General Manager and Chief Operating Officer Wayne Hodes and Front Office Assistant Todd Pay were introduced for the first time to the public. From there, interest in the team seemed to mushroom. Fans were getting excited to see their new stadium and their new team. It was the talk of the town and eventually the talk of the entire area. Interest was coming from deep inside Lower Bucks County in Pennsylvania. It was coming from as far east as the Jersey Shore and as far north as New York City. Professional baseball certainly had the ear of the public. Now it was just a matter of their eyes seeing the realization of a long-awaited dream finally coming true. And in early 1994, a logo was matched to the name Thunder as Mercer County Executive Robert Prunetti brought to life the most eye-catching design in minor league baseball. The Thunderbird was a mythical bird that would rise up and create thunder and lightning by beating its breast with its, with its wings to connote power. Um, You'll notice that it has two heads, two heads shooting lightning out of it, out of the, out of the mouths. The one head is looking backwards to represent the past, a rich heritage, not only with the people of this area, but also even in baseball and sports history itself. As the calendar flipped from one month to another, the anticipation of opening day was intensifying. The team in the county were doing everything they could to make sure the facility was going to be finished on time for the April 16th opener against the Reading Phillies. Tickets and merchandise were being sold at a rapid pace and stories concerning the team's arrival were being circulated throughout the local newspapers. But as the 16th moved closer, the impact of the worst winter in more than a decade began to increase. Finally, because of an inability to finish the stadium, it was decided that opening night would be postponed and the team would start the 1994 home schedule in Wilmington, Delaware and Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. For the players, getting a chance to take some swings at Veterans Stadium may have been their only chance to play in a major league facility. For the fans of the Trenton Thunder, it meant putting off the excitement for at least 11 days. But those 11 days turned into nearly a month when, on April 27th, the Albany Colony Yankees felt the playing field at Mercer County Waterfront Park was unsafe for their team. Thousands of fans who had entered Waterfront Park to catch a glimpse of the expected home opener were heard moaning when the announcement of the cancellation came over the loudspeaker. But the players in the Thunder management quickly turned a negative into a positive by keeping the concession and merchandise stands open for several hours and interacting with the fans on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The next day, General Manager Wayne Hodes talked about the decision to postpone the opener. What we are going to do is reschedule our home opener. We are canceling this series in addition to the, uh, to the New Britain series here at Mercer County Waterfront Park. Unfortunately, the rain has saturated the field to such a point where we're not sure that we will be able to play that series or the Albany game. All of the delays and cancellations were soon forgotten, though, because on May 9, 1994, in front of close to 7,000 fans, the Trenton Thunder, with left-hander Trevor Miller on the mound, took on the Binghamton Mets in the start of a four-game series at Waterfront Park. 
fans who always dreamed of having a team they could call their own were finally fulfilled. The Thunder went on to lose their home opener 5 to 3 when Binghamton scored two runs in the top of the ninth inning with the start of something special something no one would soon forget had begun. The Trenton Thunder in their hometown Kelly Green and Royal Blue uniforms were something to behold and everyone involved knew it was a picture worth remembering. Everything that fans need to, uh, to enjoy a game and everything that players need to play a game is here and it's ready and I just, I just want the fans to have a good time. That's what this is all about. It's for them. It's for the people of this county and they're the most important ingredient of this whole mix. Put together a very professional marking operation. There's a, a special gimmick or a giveaway just about every night and that's going to continue for years to come. So I'm convinced that the novelty is never going to wear off. Uh, baseball is more popular than ever. It is our national pastime, but I think you're going to find it to be uh, even uh, more exciting and more interesting here in Mercer County because of the stadium and because of the Thunder. This is a very happy day, not only for me, but it should be a very happy day for the people of this community because I know that this is going to be a tremendous success and it's going to be a great pastime facility that's going to be available to the people of our community. Following the 5-3 loss to the Binghamton Mets on May 9th, the Thunder record sat at 13-16. Trenton went on to maintain a 500 record for a quarter of the way through the season. Manager Tom Runnels, who brought major league experience not only as a player but also as a manager to Trenton, was trying to mix a group of minor league veterans with some of Detroit's young and exciting prospects. There was right-hander Brian Edmondson, a sinker ball pitcher from Riverside, California, who went on to lead the staff in victories with 11 wins. Catcher Joe Perona, one of the fan favorites because of his gritty play behind the plate. Outfielder Justin Mayshore, the outspoken and free swinging center fielder who possessed a major league arm, which he showed off many times during the course of the season. Then there was the pride of the Trenton Thunder, the jewel of the Tigers organization, a switch hitting first baseman from El Cajon, California, named Tony Clark. Clark stood six feet, eight inches tall and was starring for the team at the ripe age of 21 years old. He was an up-and-coming superstar who was using Waterfront Park as his own personal launching pad. Uh, I'm ready for any challenge that, that Detroit's willing to offer me. Um, coming into this year, I had a big challenge simply because I hadn't played a whole lot of baseball and there weren't too many people that were sure uh, whether or not I could handle playing at this level. Um, but I've continued to work and I've continued to improve and, and hopefully I'll be able to do the same on the next level. The former number one draft pick had battled injuries and indecisiveness for the first four years of his professional career but had a world of expectations tagged to his solid goal personality. Although he never played a full year of minor league baseball before 1994, he showed glimpses of consistent power. When he arrived in Trenton, there were many who didn't think he could stay healthy for a full season, but he knew better, and he did not let the fans or the Tigers down. Clark wowed everyone with his sweet swing and ever-improving power. There were times when he carried his teammates offensively with long, eye-catching home runs. He had a work ethic that every youngster should emulate, and a fondness for kids. He was spotlighted by local and national media and became a player everyone would talk about. When he left for AAA Toledo in early August, you got the feeling he would never look back. In all, Tony Clark hit 279 for the Thunder with 21 home runs and 86 RBIs. At the time of his promotion, he was first in the league in runs batted in and third in home runs. His RBI total would remain atop the Eastern League for two more weeks despite his departure for Ohio. Counting his numbers with the Mud Hens, Clark finished with 23 home runs and 99 RBIs. He had career highs in home runs, RBIs, base hits, at bats, and of course, games played. You know, I think I'll remember the fans the most. Uh, I've never been in a, in a ballpark where the fans have been so receptive, so uh, supportive, uh, game in and game out. I mean, uh, you know, games I go 0 for 4 or games I go 4 for 4, the fans have still been there, the fans have still been outside, the fans have been willing to shake my hand after the game. Uh, they've been here when we lost, they've been here when we won. Uh, I think uh, regardless of anything else that's happened this year, it's been a long year, but um, the fans have been there throughout. Although Tony Clark became the talk of Trenton in 1994, the spotlight reserved for home games at Waterfront Park was shared by many. There was Trenton's public address announcer, Brandon Hardison, a local product whose voice became synonymous with Thunder Games. There were the vendors who game after game provided a local smile and a friendliness which made the park so enticing. But the one person who reserved much of the spotlight was the Thunder's ever smiling and always entertaining mascot. Boomer, the big blue Thunderbird with oversized sunglasses and a bright yellow beak, entered the scene in early May, and it seemed as if he was a lifelong resident of Trenton. Designed by Bill Pay, a Trenton post office employee with a world of artistic talent, Boomer was a fixture at every Thunder home game and also throughout the community. 
His antics brought a smile to the faces of not only the many children who watched the Thunder, but the adults as well. Now, whether it be on the field racing a youngster or in the crowd, the pear-shaped mascot grabbed the imagination of the fans and the excitement of minor league baseball. That excitement spilled over from the stands and the press box. With each half inning, Brandon would describe the festivities away from the game, like the corner in pizza giveaway, or the auto valet dirtiest car in the lot contest, or even the dizzy bat race, an event which humbled some but brought more laughter and smiles to everyone around. This is what minor league baseball was and is all about. It's families and friends getting together for a warm evening of fun. It's parents watching the gaze of a child witnessing his or her first baseball game. And it's the son or daughter watching the parent take a step back to his or her childhood. It's also marketing and making the fan feel as if he or she has been entertained. During the course of a ball game, a fan will show many emotions, from laughter to jubilation to groans of disbelief. When you enter Waterfront Park, whether it be for the first time or the 50th time, you will feel involved. There are promotional giveaways almost every night of the year, so you're not only going away with memories, but also a gift to remind you of the Thunder and their ballpark. I think the most important thing is the way the fans have come together. And we're beginning to see what I call the Chicago phenomenon with the Cubs, where people are beginning to identify themselves as Trenton Thunder fans. They want to be here because they are. One part of the Trenton Thunder which proved to be extremely effective during the spring and summer was the team's interaction with the community. Whether it be before or after games, the players became part of Trenton and Mercer County. They attached themselves to the Delaware Valley and became common people. They attended schoolyard functions and paid visits to classrooms throughout the area. Every chance they had, they signed autographs and talked about the difficulties of becoming a professional baseball player. There were a sense of pride for the people of Trenton and no one could ever change that. As they move forward, they will always have memories of their first season in a town which was reaching for something to hold on to and found it during the spring and summer of 1994. The Thunder began the season in strong fashion despite a very long and tiresome 26-day road trip. When they broke camp, there were those who felt the 500 ball club was all the Tigers could hope for, and a 500 ball club they were. By May 16th, the team was still hanging on to an 18-18 and 18 record. But as the summer wore on, the competition in the Eastern League became stronger. The number of people who came to the park, though, the ones who cheered every move Trenton made, continued to increase. By the All-Star break, just over 183,000 fans had entered the gates at Waterfront Park. That's an average of just over 5,700 per game. As the summer drew on, fans were treated to baseball celebrities like Florida Marlins prospect Charles Johnson, who was spending his summer with the Portland Sea Dogs. They were also treated to appearances by Major League veterans like Steve Howe, rehabbing a sore hamstring with the Albany Colony Yankees, and left-handed starting pitcher Sterling Hitchcock, who made a brief stop in Trenton with those same Yanks before heading up to the big club. And who could forget a young right-hander from Annapolis, Maryland, who tossed a perfect game for the Bowie Bay Sox. Rick Forney became the first and only Eastern League pitcher to pitch a perfect game in 1994. The fans were not only treated to baseball, they were also introduced to celebrities such as actor James Earl Jones, baseball balladeer Terry Cashman, U.S. Senator Bill Bradley, baseball legend Bob Feller, jazz guitarist Stanley Jordan, and Philadelphia oh, Eagles players okay. Mark McMillan and Jeff Seidner, to name a few. There were also many others who helped make the 1994 season so mesmerizing. But the biggest stars of all remained the fans. By season's end, with the team cemented in last place in the Southern Division of the Eastern League with a 55-85 and 85 record, the stands at Waterfront Park were overflowing. In all, the Thunder had a record 30 sellouts and averaged just over 6,100 fans per game at Waterfront Park. Both of those statistics were tops in the league. All of this left everyone in Mercer County looking for more and looking toward 1995. As the first season for the Trenton Thunder came to a close, though, the fans in the front office were dealt an unexpected blow. Owner Jim Maloney, at the age of 49, suffered a heart attack and passed away on September 6th, one day after the conclusion of the season. Maloney was probably best remembered for his love of baseball and his concern for the fan. Many times during the course of a ball game, you would see him walking through the stands at Waterfront Park, interacting with the fans. When he entered a room, there was a whirlwind which accompanied him. That's because when he walked through the doors, things were bound to happen. It is his work ethic and his desire and love for the fans that everyone associated with the Thunder strives to emulate. We knew we would do well because we thought that between ourselves, the county executive and the mayor, we had correctly assessed the pent-up demand for professional baseball in Trenton. 
but no one expected us to do this well. You have Trenton Thunder families now. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable to see. And you see people up on the concourse with little babies in bassinets, you know, watching the game. And they have the little infant Trenton Thunder t-shirts and little hats in the, in the bassinets. And, you know, I should be around to see it, but those people will be coming here for the next 30, 40 years. Although Jim will not be around to see the 1995 season, it was his concern for the fan of the Thunder, which helped the team's front office turn the page on a successful first year and begin writing a new chapter for 1995. It's a chapter which no longer includes the Detroit Tigers, but it does include a very storied American League franchise. That franchise, the Boston Red Sox. I was just trying to get used to Detroit. Now I got to get used to Boston, but I don't care who's in here as long as they're in here playing baseball in the city of Trenton. We are going to uh, upgrade our player development program, place more emphasis on winning at the higher levels. Uh, and so it, it's, it's going to be a good union. There, there's uh, needs to be met from both sides. So once again, thanks to America's pastime, the pulse of Trenton is beating at a rapid pace, at a pace that says move forward and only periodically reflect on the past, reflect on the last year and all the hard work. All the hard work and dedication which made a particular summer along the Delaware River, one to remember.